First of all, I would like to thank Gülchen and Hans for their very kind invitation. And it's a great pleasure and honor to be here after 13 years when I was here the last time. So I would like to talk to you about the ethics of the COVID lockdowns from a libertarian perspective. And you might think, well, this has been already a long time ago. And it's also very clear that it's a horrible crime. But nevertheless, it's necessary to talk about it. It's of course true that it has been a horrible time. It has already been four years. And indeed, it's a time no one wants to remember, me neither. But we must never forget. And we must never forgive this time of tyranny. And we must never stop demanding justice. So it was a very special time. It was a time to st stand up, to defend the principles of justice, to denounce the lockdowns as a tyrannical attack on our li liberties, and time not to give in to the incredible pressures exercised by the state, the state-controlled media, and the vast majority of the population who was in a kind of mass hysteria due to the massive fear mongering by the state. The psychological pressure, as we know, was enormous. It was a time to separate the wheat from the chaff. And there were some disappointments in this regard. At a moment when it was crucial to stand up for liberty and against tyranny, there were some libertarians who actually defended lockdowns in principle. I won't name names. Uh, I have them here, but I finally decided not to call them out. Um, anyway, before turning to their argument, let's look at lockdowns from the perspective of a libertarian property rights ethics. Can lockdowns be justified? Are they not a clear infringement of the free freedom of movement? Well, there is no general right of freedom of movement. We only have the freedom to move on our own property. As you know, this is also an important issue in the immigration debate. Uh, immigrants cannot just come to our property without an invitation. In this regard, defenders of lockdowns could argue that most streets are government property and that the government has the right to restrict the freedom of movement on its street in order to protect the life of its citizens, not only from attacks by undesired immigrants, but also from attacks by infected citizens. And of course, the public ownership of streets is a problem. Streets should be private. And if streets were private, the owners should decide who could use them and under what conditions. Yeah. As Rothbard puts in The Ethics of Liberty, in the libertarian society, streets would all be privately owned. The entire conflict could be resolved without violating anyone's property rights, for then, the owners of the streets would have the right to decide who shall have access to those streets, and they could then keep out undesirables if they wish, if they so wished, end quote. So in other words, in a libertarian world, private street owners would decide in an epidemic which streets would remain open to whom and under what conditions. Yeah. Yet, we live in a world where most streets are public. However, even with public streets, Rothbard's opinion is clear. Discussing the case of a McDonald's restaurant opening and residents protesting the gathering of its customers on the streets, Rothbard writes, as taxpayers and citizens, these undesirables surely have the right to walk on the streets. And of course, they could gather on the spot if they so desired without the extraction of McDonald's. So in Rothbard's view, citizens and taxpayers have the right to use public streets because they are their rights, their streets. That implies that the government is not justified in restricting the movement on their streets, because in fact the street is not even the just property of the state. Quote Rothbard, as a criminal organization with all of its income and assets derived, derived from the crime of taxation, the state cannot possess any just property, end quote. 
In short, the state has no right to determine who can use, use public streets and who cannot. A curfew or lockdown is therefore a blatant violation of private property rights and cannot be justified. In a libertarian world, with private streets and private businesses, the owners impose the rules. And in the case of an epidemic, they may close their property completely to the public. Or they could invite people conditionally to their property. For instance, they could limit the number of people who can access it. They could also require tests before entering the property or declare that entering is at their own risk. They could also impose certain conditions such as, as an age restriction or the required wearing of masks and gloves. Let us discuss the other restrictions that have been implemented, such as the required closing of bars, hotels and other shops. The argument in favor of the closers has been the following. Out of solidarity with the rest of the population, especially the elderly, people should help bring the rate of infection down, flatten the curve. Because otherwise many people would die due to the limited capacities of the public health systems. People staying at home, confined to their houses, would save lives. They would thereby help others. And as people cannot be expected to help others and stay at home voluntarily, the government would have the right and duty to enforce a confinement that saves lives. Now, the essential, uh, the essential ethical question here is the following. Is anyone allowed to use violence to ensure that people will help their fellow men? Can the use of coercion to make people help others be justified? And here Rothbard's answer is unmistakable, quote, it is impermissible to interpre interpret the term right to life to give one an enforceable claim to the action of someone else to sustain that life. In our terminology, such a claim would be an impermissible viola violation of the other person's right of self-ownership, end quote. So note for that for Rothbard and libertarians in general, the concept of rights is purely negative. Rights protect the radius of a person's action that no one else can interfere with using aggressive violence. So property rights establish the area in which an individual can act freely. Rothbard continues, quote, no man can therefore have a right to compel someone to do a positive act. For in that case, the compulsion violates the right of person or property of the individual, individual being coerced. As a corollary, this means that in the free society, no man may be saddled with the legal obligation to do anything for another, since that would invade the former's rights. The only legal obligation one man has to another is to respect the other man's rights." End quote. Now Rothbard gives two examples to argue that no one may use violence to make someone help another person. The first one is an example provided by Friedrich August von Hayek. In this example, there exists a monopolist owner of water in an oasis. And Rothbard's point points out that the owner has the right not to sell water to customers. The owner is within his rights in reserving the water for himself and cannot be forced to help thirsty people by selling the water at a low price. Quote, the situation may well be unfortunate for the customers, as are many situations in life, but the supplier of a particularly scarce and vital service is hardly being coercive by either refusing to sell or by setting a price that the buyers are willing to pay. Both actions are within his rights as a free man and as a just property owner. The owner of the oasis is responsible only for the existence of his own actions and his own property. He is not accountable for the existence of the desert or for the fact that the other springs have dried up." End quote. So if we apply this reasoning to lockdowns, the owner of a business has the right to open it and the pedestrian has the right to walk on the street. They are only responsible for their own actions and their own property and not for the existence of the coronavirus or the, for the fact that government hospitals are overcrowded. Of course, it is a different case if someone knows that he is infected and opens his business with the intention of infecting and doing harm to the customers. This would be criminal behavior and defensive violence 
such as closing down the business by the threat of force, would be justified. But how do we know that the opening of the business is really an act of aggression on part of an infected owner? As Rothbard points out, the burden of proof is on the people using violence. Quote, the burden of proof of the the burden of proof that the aggression has really begun must be on the person who employs the de de defensive violence." End quote. So no one is justified in using violence just because he perceives some risk of a potential threat. The threat must be proven in court. The threat of aggression must be palpable, immediate, and direct. So it does not suffice to say that, well, I feel threatened by people walking on the street because well, they might infect me. Someone can always perceive risk and a potential threat. Similarly, I might stay, state, I feel threatened by cars driving on the street because they might hit me. However, that does not give me the right to use violence and stop others driving their cars. First, I would have to prove that they intentionally want to do harm driving the car. For instance, they are plotting a terrorist attack. Or I would have to pro prove that another person is negligent, for instance, driving drunk. Applied to our case, I would have to prove that someone intentionally wants to infect others or that someone is infected and does not hold sufficient distance from others. Appealing to a pos possible risk of infection alone is not sufficient. Indeed, allowing violence, indeed, allowing violence in case of perceived risks Risk gives leeway to a war of all against all. As Rothbard puts it, once one can use force against someone because of his risky activities, the sky is the limit, and there's virtually no limit to aggression against the rights of others. Once permits someone's fear of the risky activities of others to lead to coercive action, then any tyranny becomes justified." End quote. And in this context, uh, the legal principle of in dubio pro reo is vital. One only knows if someone is a criminal when he is convicted. Until people are convicted, they must enjoy all the rights of innocence, such as being allowed to leave their houses and open their stores. As Rothbard reminds us, they are innocent until proven guilty. Rothbard provides a second example for his claim that no one can be forced to help others. This example is curiously enough about an epidemic and therefore it's worth quoting in full. Suppose that there, that there is only one physician in a community and an epidemic breaks out. Only he can save the lives of numerous fellow citizens. An action surely crucial to their existence. Is he coercing them if A, he refuses to do anything or leave town, or B, if he charges a very high price for his curative services? Certainly not. There is, for one thing, nothing wrong with a man charging the value of his services to his customers, i.e. what they are willing to pay. And he further has every right to refuse to do anything, while he may perhaps be criticized morally or aesthetically, as a self-owner of his own body, he has every right to refuse to cure or to do so at a high price. To say that he's being coercive is furthermore to imply that it is proper and not coercive for his customers or their agents to force the physician to treat them. In short, to justify his enslavement. But surely enslavement, compulsory labor, must be cons considered coercive in any sensible meaning of the term." End quote. So if the physician cannot be forced to help during an epidemic, then a fortiori, a normal citizen cannot be forced to help either by staying at home. It is certainly possible that one could help others in these times by staying at home, by closing businesses, by donating medical equipment, Yet forcing people to stay at home, closing their businesses and expropriating medical equipment are violations of property rights. They are crimes, plain and simple. No one has the right to confine another innocent per person to his house or oblige him to close his business. 
Now, what is now the argument that some libertarians have invoked for lockdowns? Well, they argue that people can be confined during a pandemic because they are potential aggressors. Anyone could unknowingly carry the virus and transmit it and therefore poses a potential threat to the health of others. My reply is that preemptive violence can only be, only be justified against someone, or my reply is that preemptive violence cannot be justified against someone who is just a potential aggressor. One must prove beyond any reasonable doubt that someone is infected and wants to infect others. It is unethical to use defensive violence without having proven an imminent attack. And in the context of defensive violence on behalf of others, uh, Rothbard argues that a policeman can use coercion against a suspected criminal only on his own risk. If the suspect finally is found to be innocent, the policeman must be treated as a criminal. On the contrary, the policeman can only be exonerated if the suspect finally is proved to be a criminal. One complicating issue here is that the policeman may not have the time to know if the threat is real. Yeah? Let's take the following example of a policeman who uses violence against someone who threatens the policeman with a dummy gun. Yeah? So it's not a real gun. Yeah? Actually, I owe this example to our friend Matt Mahai. The policeman does not know that he's threatened with a dummy gun. And therefore, it seems that he could be exonerated later if he starts shooting at the guy. And similarly, one may argue, and some do, that the government may not know if people are really infected with a certain virus, in which ways a virus spreads and how dangerous it really is. The policeman doesn't know the guy is not dangerous. And therefore, one might argue that the government can use coercion, confining people, and could be exonerated later because the government does not have enough knowledge about the danger of the threat. Indeed, this argument uh, that regards lockdowns as protection of property rights in times of extreme uncertainty about the real threat appears on first sight sensible. However, there are several problems with the dummy gun analogy. First, um, in the case of an epidemic, there's no one actively threatening as is in the case of the dummy gun. Second, in both cases, a means is required that is proportional to the ends sought. Maybe the policeman should first try to talk to the guy before shooting and maybe aim at the legs, his legs first. And confining someone may not be justified as other less invasive means such as social distancing are available and can be done voluntarily. Yeah, and that is crucial. People may be willing to take the risk of meeting others voluntarily. Third, while in the case of the dummy gun, a reasonable man would regard it as an imminent threat, the case of a potential virus is different. The probability of being infected with a new deadly virus that can infect other people through the air via long distances is low, especially in the outside. Fourth, there's not much time to think in the case of the dummy gun threat, while in the virus case, there is time to reason and think. And as long as there's no strict evidence that there's an imminent threat, violence cannot be initiated. Again, the burden of proof is on the person using defensive violence. In other words, if someone does not know beyond reasonable doubt that the other person has a virus that spreads easily through air over long distances, and it's very dangerous, violence is not permitted. Non-knowledge or ignorance does not excuse violence. And fifth, the dummy gun holder may argue, uh, may actually apply the analogy in his favor. The dummy gun holder may argue that he just wanted to confine the policeman as he thought that the policeman could be infected with a deadly virus, and therefore the use of the dummy gun against the policeman was just defensive violence. As the policeman was a potential threat, the dummy gun holder was justified in threatening him. And the policeman shooting 
but again, uh, but against him was just pre, uh, was against the preemptive strike. So you see, there's no limit to violence of all against all once one allows for it without having to prove that there was the imminent threat of an attack. And naturally, one must distinguish intention, intentional attacks from negligence. And hans hermann Hoppe has criticized Rothbard for only focusing on causality and not on intentionality and negligence. And Hoppe argues that besides intentionality and negligence, there exists also faultless causation, quote, Faultless causation, which remains free of punishment, exists also. Life involves an inescapable element of risk. It is incumbent on each individual to learn how to live with such risk and to ensure himself against it. However, this implies admitting that the narrow causality criterion is inadequate. What needs to be added to Rothbard's criterion would seem to be this. No one is liable for accidents involving his person and property. Instead, the risk of accidents and the insurance against them must be assumed individually by each person and property owner for himself. People can be held liable only for their actions, whether intentional or negligence, but not for accidents involving them. In other words, one must distinguish between neg negligent behavior and accidents. Yeah? It seems reasonable not to allow negligent behavior when it endangers the private property of others, such as other street users on a public street. Yeah. For, for example, a drunk driver who is not in control of his car and does not keep a prudent distance could be acting negligently and it seems to be justified to pull this driver over. Applying this reasoning to the corona crisis, Someone who is infected with the virus and does not keep far enough away from others or sneezes in the street without covering could be asked to take precautions or be sent back to his property. But what is clearly unjust and disproportionate is to prohibit everyone from driving because of the mere possibility of negligent driving or to quarantine everyone because there's a risk of infection. For a crime to exist from a libertarian perspective, there must be proven fault. If person A infects person B unintentionally and unknowingly, be it with a cold, a flu, or COVID-19, this must be considered to be an accident. Person A cannot be held liable. Again, the case is different if person A intentionally infects person B, for instance, by secretly spitting in his teacup. Similarly, A would be liable if he acts negligently sneezing person B in her face without covering his mouth. And to drive this point home, I will apply this reasoning to an example provided by our friend Walter Bloch that supposedly justifies lockdowns as defensive violence. So imagine someone with a bow aiming a deadly arrow at a tree on his own property. And the, the, the assumption is that if he misses his target, the arrow Arrow will fly into his neighbor's property, possibly hurting innocent people. Is shooting the arrow negligent behavior that should be stopped? Depending on the exact circumstances, so it seems. However, it does not justify using violence against the general population. First of all, not everyone, everyone owns a bow and arrow. Similarly, not every, everyone has a virus and can shoot it at others. Second, not everyone who owns a bow and arrow is infected, shoots, spreads germs negligently in the direction of their neighbors. If confining everyone because they could become infected and in addition could act negligently is justifies, it justified in the case of the pandemic or epidemic, one can make an analogous argument in the case of the bow and arrow. Anyone could, in principle, purchase a bow and arrow and could, in principle, shoot arrows negligently. Hence, anyone is a potential arrow threat and everyone must be locked up in their homes. Or alternatively, alternatively the sale of bows and arrows must be prohibited, gun control laws. If we allow the use of violence against innocent people, because they are a potential risk or threat to others, then there would be virtually no limit 
to the coercion that can be justified. For, in, for instance, in World War II, the US government interned Japanese people and used citizens of Japanese ancestry in concentration camps because these citizens were assumed to be a threat. They were expected to commit acts of sabotage, killing innocent people. Possibly these acts of sabotage would encourage others to copy these acts, a kind to spreading a sabotage, vi sabotage virus, leading to more and more acts of sabotage and the loss of the war. Even if we grant that there was a higher risk that US citizens of Japanese ancestry would commit such acts, this does not justify the internment, internment of innocent people. One must prove that someone is planning to commit an act of sabotage. The proof must be presented for each individual. Responsibility is individual, never collective. If we allow violence based on collective guilt, there's no limit to violence. And why not, as a preemptive measure, lock up ethnic groups that have had a higher probability of committing crimes in the past than other groups? When we allow violence against someone who's considered a threat based on statistics, there's no limit to violence. And moreover, what about other infectious diseases? If infecting others with the coronavirus is an aggressive act, what about infecting others with the flu or a mild cold? Also, mild cold can develop into a severe, severe problem for someone with a weak immune system. These are just differences of degree. If one of these instances is an aggression and immoral, the others are two. And what is the fair punishment for someone who spreads a cold? Shall we quarantine the whole population every winter because thousands die from the flu? Yeah. If we follow this reasoning, there's no limit to violence. Why not confine the whole population all the time? It saves some lives, at least for some time in the short run. There always exists a risk that someone will catch a new unknown virus, let's say COVID-25, and will infect others, becoming an aggressor. Following this reasoning, anyone is a potential threat to anyone else just by being alive and in contact with others because he may spread, spread bacteria and viruses. There's no limit to this reasoning. We live in nature and with things that we do not control completely. And unfortunately, accidents also occur. Life is risky. Let's suppose that the driver's tire was punctured on the highway, leading to an accident that hurt others. Let's suppose that the person was a careful driver whose car had recently passed inspection. What happened was not, to, was not due to the driver's negligence, but an accident and certainly does not justify prohibit prohibiting all driving. If we cannot prohibit driving because of the possibility of accidents, we cannot quarantine people because they could accidentally spread a cold or the flu. And let's take another example from driving. What if someone tries to cross a highway in a wheelchair? What if, what if this vulnerable, vulnerable person is hit by a car? Is the solution to oblige everyone to drive five miles per hour on highways from then on because there exists the possibility that someone in a wheelchair might try to cross and could get hurt? Certainly not. It makes more sense for those who are in danger of being hit to find safer paths to their destinations. And in case of the corona epidemic, older people with pre-existing illnesses can take, could take precautionary measures and isolate themselves if they wanted to. So in sum, just the possibility of an aggression does not justify the violation of private property rights. Everyone is innocent until proven otherwise. And violence against innocent people is unethical. Once we allow aggression against innocent people, such as a lockdown, we are on a slippery slope without no limits. Thank you very much.